Hello students, today we're looking at folds, turns, and zeros. That's very exciting. Mr. Butterworth, I see a warm up. I do too, and I also see the word transform, and that's exciting. Ooh, is that like transformers? I hear they're more than meets the eye. Yes, they're also robots in disguise. Oh, yeah, that's exciting. Ooh, um, okay, <laughs> property, we can do this. <laughs> uh, all right, so I'll do the hard one. That's the first one. Oh, I'll do the really hard one, which is the second one. So I know that when I distribute, and I think the real goal here is to know that if I do x times an x squared, that's really x to the first. And so I have really three x's here all together. That's x cubed. I thought you just said x times x squared was x to the first. And I was like, Mr. Carlson, what are you <laughs> teaching these kids? That's because you're not watching what I'm doing. You're only listening to what I'm saying. Right. Mr. Butterworth. Ooh, that's fun. Ooh, so I see that you're doing some double distribution here. That's right. I'm even changing colors. Although if you're colorblind, I apologize. I did not pick good color choices because blue green will be the same. Um, and my last four came out weird because I got nervous. I don't know. Um, that is a little weird. So I did x times x is x squared. x times four is four x. Minus one times x is negative one x. And then minus one times four is negative four. And then you can combine like terms right in here. Ooh. Now, so squared plus 3x plus minus 4. I like it. Uh, now, Mr. Butterworth, uh, I took the easier of the first two. Do you want to take the easier of the second two? I don't care. Whatever. All right. So then I'll do number three. Uh, and I'm going to do that in yellow. So we got x. Ooh, we got three different things to multiply. That's exciting. And the way that I'm going to do this is to multiply the first two pieces first and then take whatever that is and multiply it by the second part. Uh, and I think Mr. Butterworth would do the same thing and probably will be doing the same thing for the one he's doing. So I've got x squared plus 1x. I've got to multiply that by 1 half x plus 1. Now I'm going to multiply x squared times a half x. That looks scary, but I know that's really one times a half. And then x squared times x, we said it was x cubed. Uh, we've got x squared times one, which is plus one x squared. We've got one x times a half x. So one times a half is gonna be, I'm gonna switch colors here as well so I can be more like Mr. Butterworth. Uh, so one x times a half x is gonna be one half x squared and 1x times plus 1 is going to be plus 1x. Similarly, we could also combine these some like terms here. 1 half x cubed. My x squared and 1 half x squared. I'm going to make you guys super excited by writing that as 3 halves x squared and then I do plus love fractions. 1x. I do love fractions, so thank you for that. You're welcome. So I heard that you said you're going to multiply two things and then worry about the other thing. Now you'll notice I wrote mine in a different order than it's written in number four. Mm. I did that because I noticed that two things looked alike and I just felt like multiplying those first. That makes sense to me. It doesn't really matter. It's just that's what my brain wanted to do. So what I need to do now, this is a little crazier than what Mr. Carlson did. Are we going to get rid of that? That would be helpful. Let's do that. Go over there. Um, I have to distribute three things. So I'm going to do Ooh. x squared times 2x and x squared times 1. So I'm going to have 2x squared, dip, 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 2x cubed plus x squared. Nice, now, nice fix there. Thanks. Um, can I get crazy here? I'm going to do 4x times 2x, which is 8x squared. I'm going to line things up. Ooh, I love this way. And then 4x times 1 is 4x. So you... You're doing the same thing. I'm just gonna. So instead of writing them all in one line, you're lining up the two pieces that have an x squared, so that when you combine things, it's a little bit easier for you. Yeah, it reminds me like I have a daughter in fourth grade and a daughter in kindergarten. The fourth graders pass through um, some of her classes, and when they add, they line things up. Like I was watching her do the standard algorithm for addition, where you line the numbers up based on their place value and do like the carrying and all that mm -hmm. stuff. And this is the same idea. You're lining up the numbers that look alike. 
So our final answer for this is gonna be, sorry, my last part was four times two X and four times one. My last step is gonna be two X cubed. And then this is really a one X squared. So one X squared plus eight X squared is nine X squared. Four plus eight is 12 X and four. It also helps me remember the like, the like terms idea. So that's in there. I like it. We should probably pay attention to that thing we threw out of the way. So let's see, we're gonna translate, that means move, and dilate, that's making things bigger or smaller. Functions, describe the relationship between linear factors of a function. You have, you have to click somewhere so we can read this too. Oh, I'm sorry. I forget that it doesn't automatically do that. Describe how the linear factors of the function combine to produce intervals of increasing and decreasing in the product, so product means multiplication. Explain the behavior of a function at zeros when we have degree one and degree two, and we'll explain all this, don't worry. And then sketch graphs of degree three. That sounds like a lot of things, but if we connect everything back to our understanding of lines, it makes things a little bit easier. And that's how we're gonna approach things here. All right, ooh, a functional transformation. I feel like we talked about transformers on the previous page. They're robots in disguise. It's true. Uh, all right, so we've got this function where f of x equals three, it's constant because no matter where on this line we look, it always has a value, a height of three. Uh, and we're, I love when they say things like recall that you can translate this by adding a constant. Um, the, and we didn't do that this year, right? I think they're basing that on, well, <laughs> we kind of have. With a little bit with vertex form. Quadratic stuff. Yeah, uh, but I think they're. I, th I think it's probably from the algebra one course that they have. Which I think so too. We haven't done. Uh, so basically, what that's saying is, if I add like three plus two, this line goes from being at three to being at a height of five because now three plus two is five, uh, and that's how we change things vertically. And just to remind you of in geometry, translations were when you took a figure, maybe it was over. Oh, that's not going to get me a figure. I was no, it won't. Here. And maybe it moves over here, that's a translation, just the movement of a cool. figure. Pretend those figures are the same, by the way. Yes, I will. Uh, okay, so we're considering the point of the original function at x equals one, because the coordinates one comma three. Well, you missed the important part of what they said next. So oh. we're gonna be translating this, not by a number, Ooh. but by x, so that each point changes by a different amount. I like that, that's really confusing. Uh, so like if my X was one, my height would change by one. Mm -hmm. If my X was two, my height would change by two. Okay, maybe that's less confusing than I thought. <laughs> um, okay, so that makes a lot of sense there. Uh, and that's so exactly what you just said, your first example is what they're asking. Oh, to nice. Say. So when X equals one, that's gonna make the Y value become four because we're adding one to the three. So we're saying the one stays the same, but to the three, we add one. Yes, I like it. And I really like the way that you wrote that so that you can see the three plus one part. Um, I'm trying to write in my parentheses and I just scribbled through the problem below, sorry. I, that. I saw that, you also tried to write with the eraser a minute ago, uh, but I'll forgive you that. Um, Okay, so for the next one, we're starting at negative one comma three plus negative one to get that change in y. So that'd be now negative one. So what you mean is we're starting at the point negative one three, and then we're translating that yes. vertically by x. My apologies for sounding super confusing. <laughs> you said we're starting with the thing we ended with. <laughs> uh, I will transform my way of speaking. Oh, I see what you did there. Wait, we're supposed to plot those points. Okay. So that's one, four, so plot that point. I'm saying you, because you have the, the Apple pencil on. That's true. Know. And then negative one, one, two, okay. Plot other points after applying a vertical translation of X. Okay. All right, so if we are at two, I'm gonna go two above that. Three, I'm gonna so go three above that. Two, three would go to two, five. Yes. Three, three would go to three, six. What and about I'm, zero? 
I uh, I didn't do that one yet. So zero. Oh, I'm adding zero. That stays the same. <laughs> I know. I was trying to trick you. See if you see if you got confused. It looks like we're forming a line. It does. I was just going to say it, I've noticed that this thing looks like uh, we're going up at the same mount each time. And looks I, something like that. that not changed. That was zero. We just answered that question. Look at us. Identifying the, identify the zero of the new function. Ooh. Ooh, you made a line. So the zero looks like it's at negative three. Um, so explain how the zero is created. Ooh, this is a really cool way to think about this. So we started with the point negative three, three. And when we added the X to it, that's like saying that the height was brought down to zero. Uh, and therefore became a zero, right? Yeah. Got it. That's cool. That's a really interesting way to think about that. I like it. Ooh, functions of higher degree. Uh, I, so here we also have another recall. Uh, so we're recalling that we can dilate a function. Uh, in other words, we can stretch it, I think is the best algebraic way to describe that. Uh, by multiplying a function by a constant. We're really good at thinking about this with regards to linear things because we know something about the slopiness of them. Yes. And remember, when you think of dilations, you can also think of your eyeballs. When you go to the, the eye doctor, they dilate your eyes. That's changing the size. So the you said the algebraic way of thinking about mm. it. I'm saying the uh, human way of thinking about it, I guess. Have they had that done yet? Um, yes, yes. Because I, I, I feel like the first time I had my eyes dilated, which was a very memorable experience for me, I was like 16-ish. One, one of my daughter's friends had it, and she's like eight or nine. Huh. I wonder if it has to do with like they're wearing glasses or something that they, they noticed in the exam. I don't, think, I don't think my daughter had to do it, but her friend did. <laughs> Interesting. Anyway, now that we've told you about eye health... Uh, <laughs> Uh, let's talk about this idea of making degrees of a higher function. Uh, so I'm guessing that instead of multiplying by uh, a constant, like we didn't end up multiplying by or adding a constant last time, we're going to multiply by some kind of a variable. And that's the part that I skipped last time. Here we're multiplying that x plus 3 by x Ooh, Okay. to see what happens. So I moved stuff out of the way because it was all cluttered. Mm. So let's see. Graph shows the function x plus 3. Choose several points and dilate by multiplying by the x value. Ooh, so you're going to do that. Are you going to make like a triple table? I am. Ooh, that's going to be exciting. So we had, let's start with 0, 3. So we had the point 0, 3. And we're going to multiply. Oh, they already did that for us. So we multiply the y value by 0. So the new y value is zero. And so they did the same thing with negative one, two. They multiplied the y value by negative one and you get negative two. And they want us to do more. Choose several points, all right. Maybe, maybe choose one so we have something on either side of zero. Oh, I like it. So it's one, four. One times four is four. Okay. Um, can, we pick, can we pick negative three zero? I, I was going to say that because I like that point because we said it was a zero on the line. And we talked a little bit about that on the previous page. And, and I like it. Three times zero. Yes. And that's I love that's multiplying by things. Change. That's weird. Mm. Okay. I wonder if that's like a consistent thing. Uh, I'm going to do one more point just because why not? Uh, let's go with negative four, which is at negative one. And that's negative four. Huh. Okay. Uh, I think we got a whole bunch of points here. Can we graph these and see if we see any shapes? I agree. You could not. I think that we're yeah, going to see talking about number two while you do that. your face on here. That's the shape of the graph. Ooh, it, is, it will be a beautiful thing. So now it says write the equation to represent the new function x f of x. Well, we know that f of x 
is x plus three. So it helps to be on the right tool. Um, we can just do x and then f of x. Ooh, that reminds me of factored form of a quadratic. How did the dilation change the degree of the new function? Okay, so we need to mention what this means. The degree is the highest power. So if I were to multiply this out and distribute that x, oh, I didn't do my required my required thing. When I distribute, I go pew pew. Forgot oh yeah, that. that's right. So that'd be x squared plus three x. You notice that the highest power is now two. Mm. Before, when we had f of x up above. The highest power was one, because that's x to the one, as Mr. Carlson mentioned in the start, or the first problem, or whatever they call it. Now the highest power is a two, so we went from a degree one to a degree two. Uh, Mr. I Carlson also looks like a bunch of dots. Yeah, I was going to say uh, I noticed that this thing looks slightly U-shaped, uh, and based on the equation that you came up with, I can pretty confidently say that if we continued graphing all of these points this would probably be a parabola. In I fact, bet you I can produce another point. Oh yeah. Negative two, negative two. So that one right there. I like it. They yeah, made yeah. this so a little what bit. What I did is I said, well, we have two points that are both at four. Mm -hmm. And we have two points that are both at zero. So then we got to have two points that are both at negative two. And then somewhere between those would be the vertex. You were gonna say I was going to say, they were kind yeah. of mean and gave us a vertex that's uh, between x equals negative 1 and x equals negative 2. Uh, yeah, but it's just halfway in between. I think we can yeah. handle that. We just don't uh, care exactly what it is. No. And if we kind of look at the shape, we've got a parabola forming there. Uh, and I think that goes, again, with what you discovered about that equation, which is cool. So now it says identify the zeros of g of x. Hey, we already did that. We did, because they're right there. So the zeros are 0, 0, and negative 3, 0. So 0, 0, <laughs> and negative 3, 0. I wrote with a laser tool. I know, I saw. How are these related to the two linear factors? Well, x plus 3 is 0 at negative 3. And x is 0 at 0. Beautiful. All right. Uh, this looks like exactly what we were just talking about. Uh, and I guess that's a graph of the actual parabola in both of those lines that we've looked at. So that looks a little bit scarier, but that's simply all the all the different things we've dealt with so far on the scene. One of the now things that's, oh. I was saying, one of the things that I like that is that we can see the zeros for each of those lines lines up with the zero for the parabola. I really like that. Yes. And we're supposed to consider the interval between negative eight, which is the left side of the graph there, and negative three. Explain why the product of the linear factors results in g of x being positive and why the function is increasing. Whew. Sorry, <laughs> decreasing. That's a lot. So let's break this down. We have the product of the linear factors. That's because we're doing x times x plus 3. And what I see here is when I'm looking back here, both of those linear factors are negative. So mm -hmm. x is a negative number and x plus 3 is a negative number when we're talking way back there. And since we're multiplying the negative numbers, that will give us positive numbers. So you're saying that because both of these are negative in value, they're below the x-axis. When we multiply those together, two negatives multiplied makes the positive values above the x-axis. Yes. I like it. Uh, and then it's decreasing. Um, that one's a little bit harder to kind of get our minds around, but I, I've got an idea for that. Um, both of these uh, graphs of these lines are getting less and less negative. In other words, they're getting closer to zero. Their numbers are getting smaller in value. Uh, if we think about this as an absolute value type thing, uh, we've got a case of uh, where they're going to be less and less positive 
because both of those numbers are getting less and less negative at the same time. And because of that, the numbers in the parabola are getting less positive as these are getting less negative. That's a lot of words and I was trying to be not so mathy about that. But do you, do you have a cleaner way to describe that? Is it fair to say we know the function has to be going to zero because we plotted that zero? And we know that the values are positive because we just said a negative times a negative is positive. So the only way we can go from a positive to zero is to decrease. I am not comfortable with that. And I think you know why. If we're continuous? Uh, the fact that these have to be linear for that to be continually decreasing. No, well, no, I'm not even talking about the linear linear nature. I'm saying we know that the quadratic has to be going to zero. And we know that the quadratic has positive values. So since the quadratic has positive values that go to zero, then we have to decrease. And that's only because we're talking about a quadratic. There is a continuity argument, but they don't care about that, right? Yeah, uh, the, I'm more concerned about the the polynomial thing yeah. that if, if this were not quadratic, we could not make those assumptions. Got it. All right. So they they have now fallen asleep. Wake up, wake up, wake up. Okay. So for part B, consider the interval between negative three and zero. Explain why the product of the linear factors results in G of X being negative and why the function changes from decreasing to increasing. So now we're going between negative three and zero. Well, I see that one line is positive and one line is negative. Mm. So I'm going to have a positive times a negative. So that's going to result in a negative. So that explains why the product is negative. I like it. And then you could have similar arguments for the decreasing to increasing because we're going from zero and back to zero. And I noticed that at the place where we change, and I'm on eraser that I just make fun of you for, uh, we've got this thing happening where one is heading away from zero and one is heading towards zero at the same rate and at the same value. So they're like canceling each other out there. Mm. Uh, and I think that that's an important thing for what's going on there. And there's some there's calculus to some of this stuff that we're not going to get yep. into, right? That's why if we sound like we're talking really funny, we're trying to avoid using calculus terminology and stuff. Yes. Or at least I am. Yes. Uh, I was about to do the third part. I'm assuming that's on the next page. Um, no, it is not. Interesting. That's all they ask us about. Um, okay. So we've got this new function. Uh, negative the quantity x plus 3 dilating by x. So I'm going to write this function. Um, I'm going to call this g of x again. Uh, you just wrote h of x twice, buddy. Ah! There you go. Yeah, it's confusing because they used H and we often use H to talk about. Uh, oh, no, I, 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 had, I erased something. Yeah. I mean, we, we oh, sometimes yeah. build tables that way. Yeah. Uh, but I feel like X. that would be more confusing for our and humans. And then we got to multiply by the X value. So X, H of X. I fixed it. I got there. There we go. All right. Um, so should we do the same idea where we pick some nice values? So like negative three, zero would be a nice value. I agree. I'm thinking that zero, negative three would also be a nice value for us to look at. Um, Can I pick one negative four? Because one's an easy number to deal with. I like it. Uh, and how about negative one, negative two? All right, we'll start there. So all we got to do is multiply the middle column by the left column, basically. What did you just do? I, I drew a line. <laughs> it was an accident. It happened. So zero. I, I did the first two because I'm really fast at multiplying. 
You are. And then one times negative four is negative four. I'm shirking your gold. And then negative one times negative two is two. All right, so now I'm gonna plot some of these points. I'm gonna erase the dots that I drew. Uh, so we've got negative three, zero. Oh, it's in the same place, it's weird. Uh, zero, zero, I'm one. I'm predict that it's gonna look very similar to before. Weird. But upside down. It's like you're psycho or something. Um, oh, is that because this is the same thing as the last one, but now we've got a negative in front. And we can do the same thing where since we have those two zeros, we see the symmetry. So mm. there's got to be a point right there. And then there's got to be a point right there because of the symmetry of, the, of this function. And now we can kind of see this parabola forming with my awesome art so I didn't cross out our points. Uh, I am an expert at drawing parabolas, apparently. Uh, that makes sense. Wow, it's like we came to the page and Mr. Butterworth is already there. I wanted to write down what h of x was so we didn't get confused. Mm. So it says write down the new function, which Mr. Carlson on the other page called g of x, but on this page they're calling j of x. I have to be careful with saying these things. Why um, don't you think they use the letter i? Because I want to believe that they had a reason for it. I'm glad you went for the pun, because uh, I was going to go for the pun also. So what function family? I, so I think that they want us to distribute this out again. So that's going to be pew, negative x squared. And then negative, be careful on this view because that's a big view there. Um, that's negative 3x. You got to make sure the negative hits both those things. If I were uncomfortable with this, would it be okay for me to view the inside first? Yes. <laughs> yes. And I, then, I think okay. fair move. And then pew, pew. So. Uh, identify the zeros. We already did that. It you was did. negative three zero and zero zero for the best. And those are the same zeros as for those lines. I like that they keep asking that so we can keep uh, thinking about that. Nice smile. And this is the same thing that we just drew. Uh, so this is the same function. This is the parabola that comes out of that. And these are our two lines. Okay. Um, so we're going to look at the same thing. I'm going to let Mr. Butterworth move that before I start writing things. There we go. Uh, between negative 10, it's the end of the graph, and negative 3. So I'm going up to here. I, the thing I did move, if you missed what I moved, re rewind a little bit, because they do talk about where it turns. That's just the vertex of this parabola. Mm. Uh, but they do talk about where it changes from increasing to decreasing. Cool. By it, I mean the purple curve. Yep, I like it. Uh, okay, so why the product is negative. I'm going to use the same reasoning you had, that we have a negative value and a positive value. And if we multiply a negative times a positive, we get a negative value. Why is it increasing? So... I'm going to use the same type of argument that I used before uh, in that we're both of these cases heading towards zero, but the negative starts more negative than the positive is positive. So the negatives are kind of pulling that down, but they're pulling it down less as we go um, because we're getting closer to zero and we happen to reach that point uh, where they're equivalent to each other a little bit later. And that was interesting because in the last one, they had equivalent absolute values where we had that turning point. Uh, and here we have equivalent values, which would also be the same absolute value. Hmm. And now we're supposed to consider negative three to zero. Oh, I messed everything up. Oh, I really messed everything up. If only there were an undo button that you could press. No, see, I already did. There, there we go. Okay. Um, where am I supposed to be? Right there. All right. Sorry about that. I had an issue. Um, so we're supposed to go negative three to zero. 
explain why the product is positive. So we have a negative linear value on one line and a negative value on the other line. And therefore that gives us a positive. And same idea for the increasing to decreasing, we're going from a zero and back to a zero. So the only way to do that is to go away and come back. Okay. What do you know about the linear factors when the resulting quadratic function has a positive A value? I'm gonna go with either both positive or both negative. I do not like the way that you wrote that. Why? Um, because if we, if we say the linear function factor is positive, that's not the same thing as what you mean. I'm talking about the y values of the linear function. That's not what this is asking. Oh, so you're saying I was wrong. No, I'm, you need another word in there. So you're saying I was kind of right. Yes. So I should leave it there. And I can't undo what you did apparently. There we go. Um, so what word do you think is missing? What do you know about the linear function factors when the resulting quadratic function has a positive y value? Not Either y value, you said y value again. Darn it, positive <laughs> a value. And just so we know what we're talking about, this is saying a, I'll use vertex form. So that number there. I don't know what word you want me to put. Slope. Oh, both um, slopes positive or both slopes negative? Yeah, and this is totally coming at this as us being calculus teachers uh, and having to be really careful about the difference between something being a positive value and a positive slope. Uh, the way that Mr. Butterworth or originally read this was about the y values instead of a values. And if both values of the function would be positive, that's cool. That's exactly what we're talking about. Here, we're talking about whether it's an up parabola or a down parabola. And if it's an up parabola, either both lines have to be positive slope or both lines have to be negative slope. So you might yeah. get from both that. Are both negative. Does that mean on the second part, it's they have to be opposites? Yes. Or let's, let's say the slopes have opposite signs. Oh, because you don't want them to be necessarily the exact. Yeah. You're uh, all finicky on us here, Mr. Carlson. It's my job. So one would be positive and one's negative for slope for that. Love it. Ooh. Now we're creating new zeros of functions. That's exciting. Uh, so we're being told that we're starting with the function uh, x minus one. That's this graph here. And we're going to dilate that by x plus three. So x plus three times x minus one is what we're going to end up doing. Uh, I predict, oh, we have to do that anyway. Huh. I thought they were going to have us do kind of the stepping into that again. Uh, I predict this is going to be a parabola. And I can find the zeros pretty quickly for that too, because that's already in factored form for us. So we're supposed to sketch the graph of the new function. So how are you going to graph this? You're going to start with the zeros? Um, I, I feel like I want to start with the table like we did before, but I, I can also kind of see what's going on here. And I don't want to do something that's deliberately obtuse just for the sake of doing that. Hmm. Uh, so this is going to have a zero at negative three. Good luck is, three. It's fine. There are two. Um, pesky pesky. I know. And it's just, it's just a sketch. So we don't have to be that precise. Yeah. So the other thing that I could do here 
would be to sketch this line of x plus 3. Mr. Mm -hmm. Butterworth's going to really like this one. And use the same type of thinking we had for the previous problems that between these two zeros, one line's positive, one line's negative. We're going to be down because it has to be a positive and negative together. On the right side, both of these are positive. So our graph's going to go up in the positive side. And on the left side of this, both are negative. Negative times negative is going to be positive as well. That's a terrible looking saying, parabola. And when you're saying both, you mean the y values there are both. Yes. The y yep. values here are both positive. Um, and I'm, I'm really not comfortable using the lines to talk about the uh, increasing, decreasing nature of our parabola without talking about calculus. They don't uh, mention that, so we don't have to worry about that. Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to stay away from that. Now you've got to squeeze in x plus 2. Oh, what the heck? So this is like a third one that has x plus 3, x minus 1, and now we're having to get more complicated? That is right, but we can use the parabola, blah, blah, blah. Okay, well, I'm going to graph x plus 2 on here. Um, So then we consider just like they did before, we're going to consider the intervals. I'm going to draw on these intervals. This is a tight fit here. Yeah, I really wish this graph was much larger for us. I'm not going to change the size because that would mess up everything. Um, so I drew some vertical bars there for our intervals. And now only care about the red curve and the blue line. So if I get rid of the red line. So if you look at the y values of the blue line and the y values of the red curve, to the left, you have a negative and a positive. So those are going to be negative y values. So you're saying that somewhere down here, we're going to be doing negative -y stuff. Yeah. Again, we're looking right there. We're taking the y values of the blue and the y values of the red. And a negative times a positive is a negative. And then we got the y values of the red are negative. Oh, we got to be careful because there's an interval between those two. Ooh, right here. The y values of the red are negative. I was confused. And then the y values of the blue are negative. And so we have to go positive for a short bit right in there. I made that extra steep just to kind of show that it was there. And then similarly, we have the y values of the red are negative, And then the y values of the red are positive. So we got to go negative there. And I've got to come back to zero where we know that zero is. And then, and don't worry, we're going to hit this again um, in, in, a, in a slide or two. And then we have a positive and a positive, so we're going to go positive again. So, so this graph looks something like this. And we'll, we'll talk through, if that just blew up your brain, it's okay. It's okay. We're going to see it a little bit more. What's also really nice is that we can do this very easily in Desmos. Uh, and that's going to be a really good advantage for us. So now we got to say, what do we notice about dilations of each function and the zeros of each function? Is it fair to say the zeros do not change? Uh, the zeros do not, or the zeros are connected to all the factored pieces. So but those don't, yeah. Yeah, so the zeros of the original yep. factors stay zeros on the new function. Um, and then how do the zeros appear to be related to increasing, decreasing behavior of the functions? Thinking about to have some dogs bark. Oh, maybe not. Uh, it seems like right now the zeros are places where we change from either increasing to decreasing or decreasing to increasing. That's not what happens at all. You meant well with that, but your brain exploded a little bit. In between the zeros. There we go. In between the zeros. I, I was I was like, wait, I forgot something. In between the zeros. Yep. That's where we change from increase and decreasing and decrease into increasing. I figured you might have forgotten a word in there. Yeah. So we have to be careful to assume that it's necessarily exactly in between. It may be. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. So that's just what I'm thinking right now. So it looks like we change increasing to decreasing in between our zeros. All right, so now we've got the same thing. They're giving us a parabola. 
and they want us to multiply this by x plus 3 and they gave us the same silly scale. Um, Mr. Butterworth, I'm going to have you memorize part B and make this much bigger. Okay. Have you memorized it yet? Yes. Because I think that seeing this in a larger format is going to help us uh, see what's going on a little bit better. Uh, so we had x plus 3 as our line. That's interesting. Ooh, that has the same zero as the parabola. So there's like a zero that shows up twice. So is it fair to say, I think R of X was X minus one times X plus three? Uh, and then times X plus three again. Oh, so P of X was this. No, P of X was the one we did before. Isn't that what's up there? No, I think P of X was, you keep talking about this, I'll verify what I'm thinking. Okay, I think R of X is X minus one times X plus three. Uh, times another x plus 3. And p of x had an x plus 2. p of x was the one we did two slides ago. Oh, OK. So that's why we had three different places. Now we have just two because one's the same one twice. Yes. Cool. Uh, so we can do the same kind of boundary setting that we did before, uh, where we're kind of breaking this into places that we have zeros, it's a little bit weird because we only have two zeros this time. Um, all right, on the left side, I see one positive and one negative. So is it fair to say that we expect down here to be somewhere negative E? Yeah, so again, we're talking about the Y values. We have a negative Y value and we have positive Y values. Okay, and then between these two, oh, I've got, I know I have to hit zero here. I know I have to hit zero here, but now we've got the negative and the positive switched. So, so this still, still has to be negative. Oh, does that mean we do like a doing and bounce off? Yeah, I, I mean, it's got to because there's no other way for me to go zero, negative zero and not, because I can't go through there. That's weird. You okay. Um, and then we have two things that are positive values. So those multiplied together is going to give us another positive value, something like this. So is it fair to say, now we're supposed to compare your lovely golden one with what we did before. Mm -hmm. Similarity would be, they look quite similar. They in do. In terms of what we're doing over here and over here. They look quite similar. They got kind of a, a, a similar mm -hmm. vibe going on. They have a difference in the fact that we have this bouncing thing happening here. Whereas in P of X, we went through, we went down and we came back up, which you'll see right there. So there's, there's that difference there that we're not doing this bouncing thing that it seems like you did there. We just went through and kind of kept going. Yeah, but I have a similar overall shape. Yes. All right. Oh, this is the same page. I saved that just in case. Oh, okay. I was very um, confused. All right, uh, so this is looks like the same things that we just did, but now with some opportunities to practice. Would this be a good thing for students to try on their own? This would be. They should give it a shot in either their workbook or on the Jamboard and see what you get. And you can verify it in Desmos. I don't think you need us to do it. Yeah, I think that's fair. Um, I think the next page might be the last page of stuff. Oh, it's the same type of thing. So uh, I, think, I think you may be able to do this now yourself try it so try to figure out the suggestion we're going to have on both the last page and this page is draw in this line like x mm, plus four yeah. draw in this line x minus two if you're struggling with that part if you're not sure how to draw that part you can draw that part on desmos and then copy what that looks like onto this graph yep. and then try to figure out what the curve looks like don't put the whole thing in desmos right away because that's not gonna be as much fun but so copy that x plus uh, four graph, which you should be able to graph by hand, but if you can't, that's okay. Put it in Desmos and look at what x plus four looks like, sketch it on the graph, and then figure out what the overall things looks like.
the other thing I like about this is when you're going to check your work, uh, you can just in Desmos for like for this one type x plus four times h of x. As long as on the previous line, you've written this as h of x so that you can check your work very easily in Desmos. Uh, and I like that quite a bit about this. Uh, and just to make sure, all right, so this is based on what you do in the previous questions. So I think that uh, you're going to have to wait to answer this until later. And then we're into the talk the talk, which we're asking you to answer on your own anyway. This is so exciting, Mr. Butterworth. We've done great.